Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio. Brought to you by OnPay. Built in Atlanta, OnPay is the top rated payroll and HR software anywhere. Get one month free at OnPay.com. Now, here's your host. We can't are here, a very special GSU ENI radio broadcast. But before we get started, I got to thank our sponsor, OnPay. Without them, we could not be sharing these important stories. So be sure to support them. Today on GSU ENI radio, we have Nate Bennett, and he is the executive MBA faculty director for GSU's Robinson College of Th- Business. Welcome, Nate. Well, thank you for having me. Well, before we get too far into things, tell us about the Executive MBA program, uh, what what it's about, and who do you serve through that? Sure. The, um, the Robinson Executive MBA is the, uh, the longest-running EMBA program in the Atlanta market. Uh, we <clears throat> serve um, high-potential executives who are mid-career and preparing themselves uh, for a next step uh, in, their, uh, in their organizations. Uh, we also obviously have a fair number of entrepreneurs who are learning how to tool up um, when it comes to, to uh, taking on the skills and capabilities they're going to need to guide their ventures. Um, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a really uh, a powerful learning experience, I think. It, like other executive MBA programs, meets alternate weekends uh, at our Buckhead campus. Um, and we're excited for the, the class that's starting in, uh, in September. Now, walk me through who is the appropriate candidate uh, for going through the program. Is this something that the corporation that they're working for says, hey, you should do this, this will help you in your career? Or is this kind of an individual decision that says, you know what, for my own benefit, I'm going to take this? Well, I think ultimately, you know, individuals are responsible for their career development. It's great when you have a supportive organization. Um, because uh, it it, uh, it uh, just makes it a little bit easier to take on the additional work of going to graduate school, uh, <clears throat> but ultimately the individual has to make that uh, has to make that call. And I think the the key thing for someone to consider is uh, timing, because you really do need things to align in order uh, for the program to have the best uh, the best return for you on your investment. If you wait too long. Um, it's an awful lot of work and you don't have that many years post degree to earn a return. If you do it too early, you're not really in a position to fully appreciate the importance and the complexity and, and the nuance of the things that you're learning. So the sweet spot, I think, is someone who is sort of mid thirties to mid forties. Um, and, uh, you know, there are generally two reasons to, to go. One is because you're trying to create an inflection point in your career trajectory. Uh, the other is that you really want to change uh, verticals. So maybe you've come up in sales and you really want to get into operations, for example. The MBA is a great uh, program to help prepare you to make uh, that sort of a move as well. Well, as a faculty director, is there a difference in someone who is a um, teaching the person that maybe kind of gone through a work experience for 10 years or so, or 15 years, even, I guess, in some cases, 20 years, as opposed to the young person right out of high school? Uh, absolutely. I think the, the teaching is uh, is really challenging because we're tested by our students every every class. Um, I think fundamentally the difference is that, uh, you know, people use the expression uh, sage on the stage for, uh, for teaching undergraduate and early career people where the professor is sort of expected to be the, the fountain of knowledge at the front of the classroom, filling up these empty vessels that sit in the various seats in the classroom. Um, for executive teaching, you're really much more of a conductor, right? You have experienced people who bring a lot to the classroom, and your job isn't so much pouring knowledge into them. They have a lot of knowledge. Your job is to sort of help them harmonize all the experience that they bring with what we know from research on organizations to create a deeper understanding of why things go the way they do, whether it's in finance or marketing or leadership. So then most of your faculty that are teaching at the executive MBA level, they are people 
that have current careers or this is something they've kind of retired and now this is their way of serving kind of the folks that help them in, along the way? It's a mix. We have, uh, we have some uh, faculty who teach in the program who are practitioners and, and have current businesses. Uh, we have some faculty who are uh, master teachers who have um, been at Robinson for a long time. Um, and we have some faculty who are really at the cutting edge of uh, research and developing new knowledge uh, in, in areas. For example, data science, you know, is an area where, uh, you know, having somebody who's really helping create our understanding of how to make sense out of big data is really valuable. So it's a, it's a mix. Now, how has the program kind of handled the pandemic? Is this something that uh, affected your students? I know uh, young people that were going to college, like all of a sudden it's online. There's all these changes. Did that uh, have similar impact to the executive MBA program? Well, yeah, I think it's it's been hard to it's hard to find you know an industry that hasn't been impacted by the by the pandemic. Obviously, in March. We made a quick pivot to online teaching, uh, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels. Um, one of the things that we did in the EMBA program that our schedule made possible was that we stayed synchronous. So um, most universities, when they pivoted to online, they moved to an asynchronous model. So there would be a website that students would go to watch recorded lectures and uh, read, uh, do readings and, and, and activities at their convenience. Because our students have booked blocks, specific blocks of time, and because we rely on our students to be a big part of the class experience, we were not comfortable with moving to an asynchronous model. So like a lot of other organizations, we relied on video conferencing to have classes live, just not in person. So I think the disruption for our faculty and students was somewhat minimized by that because we just had to learn a new technology. We didn't need to learn really a new way of teaching and learning. Um, the plans right now are to be back on campus in the fall. Um, we're planning for that, but we also realize that the, the pandemic is in charge, not, not us. So we're also planning uh, for what we need to do if, if coming back to campus isn't safe. And then will you execute it in the same manner where you'll all be kind of gathering around uh, a computer at the same time? Well, I think that's certainly a possibility. You know, we've worked very hard with the, uh, the faculty who have been doing it to, uh, to leverage their learning to help the faculty who are lined up to teach this fall prepare. So I think we, we're confident that we can do that well. But we also think that, you know, it's possible that that um, perhaps some opportunities to gather will be possible, just perhaps not other opportunities. So we're trying to very much stay agile, <clears throat> not get too locked into anything, uh, because what we want to be as in person as we can safely be is, is what it boils down to. And so um, that may that may suggest that uh, there's an in between that we can find a way to occupy now, how many people are in a cohort typically? Is this hundreds of people or is it dozens? Like what is the kind of the amount of folks that are kind of working through this? Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it would be dozens to, to use your, your scale there, you know, mid thirties to mid forties is a, is a typical class size for us. And then do they all work as kind of together? They all like once they start, then they're going to finish together. Yes. It's a, it's a cohorted program. So everyone starts in uh, in the fall of year one and then uh, graduates in uh, January, a year and a half, well, or finishes their studies in, in January, a year and a half later. And then um, do you have any advice for the folks that are going through this pandemic and it's impacted their career? And then, you know, they might've thought they were on one trajectory and now, like you said, this virus is going at its own pace, but um, what things can they control in terms of, uh, kind of taking their career to another level despite this pandemic? It's a great question. You know, I think the thing that's the most interesting um, about the pandemic from a career strategy standpoint is, uh, is as follows. I, when I coach people, I, I advise them to have a, a one, a five, and a 10-year 
plan when they think about their career. And it's generally understood that the 10-year plan is the most uh, foggy, right? And that's a long way off. A lot can happen in between now and then. And so that plan is is really uh, a bit more hypothetical, right? Um, since the pandemic, I think the one-year plan is really the one that's the foggiest. I think that trying to understand what's going to be happening over the next three, six, 12 months is really, really difficult. <clears throat> what's going to happen in your industry? What's going to happen in your company? Um, and then what does that suggest is important for you, I think, really are, um, they're the big questions and they're on the immediate horizon as opposed to the bigger questions being on the further out horizon. So I think that's the biggest mind shift that people have to make is they need to understand that the time to make some really big decisions is right now. It's not in three, five or 10 years. Now, how does the Robinson College kind of um, help the alumni help the the students kind of uh, kind of bring out the most value out of going through this program. I would imagine, like you mentioned, it's a cohort. So there's 30 people in there with you. Those 30, I would hope, would become part of your network as you move forward, as everybody progresses in their career, that everybody's kind of watching each other's back as their careers kind of evolve. But also, I would like to think that the Robinson College is a resource that I would have at my disposal forever now. Like, I'm I'm part of the team. I'm part of the family. Is that how it works? It's how it, it's how it, it's how it should work. Right. And again, I think individuals have to have to um, have some um, proactivity in making sure that it happens. I guess the first thing I'd say is, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the people in your cohort become indispensable in terms of, uh, you know, the role they play in your professional network. But it isn't just your cohort. We have a very active EMBA alumni network. We've had, I guess, gosh, 40 uh, classes of executive MBA students. And that's a pretty sizable network. Uh, in addition, you know, we, we want our students, our EMBA students, to feel part of the Robinson alumni network. And that's 70,000 strong. So we have um, a massive alumni network, and we, we work very hard to try to make sure that people get uh, plugged into it. That's, that's sort of at one, at one level. I think the most important thing we do in the EMBA program specifically is that we've got a very customized, individualized leadership coaching uh, experience that lasts the entire program. And so there, there isn't a month that goes by that you're not being coached, encouraged, prodded uh, to be thinking about, you know, what is what is your plan for leveraging what you're getting out of this program, both in terms of how are you going to be a more effective executive when you go back to work on Monday after class weekend, but also what are you going to try and do with this degree once you finish? Uh, so we make a huge investment in that individual coaching. I think that's a real uh, a real value to our students. Now, what's a resource uh, that you kind of maybe deal with every day that you're like, man, why aren't these students taking advantage of this? It's right here. Uh, you mentioned personal accountability. You mentioned being proactive. But what's something that's maybe at their disposal that you don't feel that they're leveraging enough well, one thing that um, I would like to see more of the students leverage uh, is this online course that we've uh, we've built <clears throat> to help people strategize uh, around resetting their career strategy in the face of the pandemic. So when 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 things began to become uh, to come apart, I guess in uh, late February, early March, we recognized that we were going to have a lot of alumni who were hurting. Uh, some would be out of work, and others would just be stalled because of what was going on in their industry. So we built a free online course that guides alumni through a, a very structured process of resetting their career strategy. Um, the course has been popular. We, we've expanded it so that it's now available to all Georgia State alumni, not just Robinson alumni. Um, it's, a, it's a really valuable resource. So we've had, oh my gosh, I don't know, three, 400 people take the course, but I would love to see more people take advantage of that. Um, 
I, I think that's the that's the, the thing I'd say. And it isn't so much that they haven't taken advantage of it. They just may have only seen something fly by in a spam email that they didn't really pay attention to. But perhaps you'll uh, you'll be helpful in getting the word out that this is available to folks. Now, what is it? Where can they find the course? If they go to the uh, the alumni association webpage, they will find a link to it there. That's the easiest way. Now, is there any kind of resources that you offer that um, kind of provides maybe networking or connecting? Like you mentioned, this vast alumni network. Is it easy for an alumni to tap into that, to go there, search, find people that might be useful to know and connect with? Um, it, it really is the case that that LinkedIn does that about as well as any other resource. <clears throat> and so we encourage people to, to take full advantage of LinkedIn. Um, and I, what, what needs to be remembered all the time is that networking, you know, it really isn't necessarily about the first person you contact being the one who can, can help you, but it's that first person knowing someone to refer you to who knows someone to refer you to who then can be the one who helps you. Um, and so it requires, you know, persistence and, and patience and you, you can't just get frustrated because your initial query doesn't get you to who you want. So, but you have to have kind of a system and kind of relentlessly attack this if you want to kind of work the network, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's become a little bit more challenging, uh, in this, uh, you know, now, uh, remote world that we're, uh, we're operating in, right? You can't, uh, you know, join a club and go to its monthly breakfast meeting, um, you know, the way you could six months ago. But the other thing, you know, the, the plus side of it is, uh, is that you can actually really be a whole lot more efficient, right? If you wanted to go to a networking event, you're going to spend 45 minutes in Atlanta traffic getting there. You're going to spend an hour at the event. You might have a meaningful conversation with two or three people because you're going to have a few minutes before the program and a few minutes after the program. And then you can spend 45 minutes getting home. So before you know it, you will have invested three hours to have two or three conversations of which one might yield something. You know, think how many connections you can make in three hours on LinkedIn. Right. right. And, and so yeah. It might, and it's right. not just in your local area. It's a world. You have the world at your disposal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you're making a, you're making a really important point there, you know, as, as more and more companies begin to question uh, co-locating everybody at a central office, it really changes the scope of a, of a job search, right? You don't have to move to Silicon Valley to have a job with a Silicon Valley company. Right. And so now suddenly all kinds of opportunities uh, are available. Of course, it's also the case that all of a sudden the the numbers of people competing for those opportunities has gone up because no one else is geographically restricted either. Um, it really speaks to the the importance of, of making sure you're continually investing in yourself to make sure that you don't lose your competitive edge in the labor market. Well, if somebody wants to invest in themselves and get involved in this uh, executive MBA program, what are the coordinates? What's the website? Uh, robinson.gsu slash EMBA will get you to our, uh, will get you to our website. Right. Um, so robinson.gsu.edu slash, uh, EMBA. EMBA. Good yeah. stuff, Nate. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're doing important work and we appreciate you. I appreciate the, the chance for the conversation and to talk a little bit about what we've got going on at Robinson. Thank you for that. Sure. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on GSU ENI Radio. And before we go, thank you again to OnPay. We could not be sharing these stories without them. So please support OnPay at OnPay.com. Today's episode of Atlanta Business Radio is brought to you by OnPay. Built in Atlanta. OnPay is the top-rated payroll and HR software anywhere. Get one month free at OnPay.com.